Stonehenge. One of the most notable landmarks in England has eluded the world for millennia. Why is it here? What is the purpose? Was it a beacon built by extraterrestrials? An interplanetary portal to Mars? An ancient machine to harness the power of the sun? What if the very answer to this unsolved mystery has been hiding in plain sight? On tonight's program, we will unravel the myth and uncover a hidden truth that will break your very conception of reality. As early as the 17th century, academics began studying the ancient site, looking to uncover the true story behind Stonehenge. And with every few decades, new theories were brought forth, but in amazement, baffling even the most qualified experts, almost none of the theories hold up. If scientific researchers remain at a loss, perhaps otherworldly explanations are at the root of the truth. We are joined by architecture expert Josh H. for a take you won't want to miss. Stonehenge, an ancient site. It's not too dissimilar to places you've seen before. To elaborate, I want to jump forward in time to the end of the 19th century, the great era of innovations in engineering that uplifted the field of architecture and reframed the built world. Rumblings of this revolution were felt in San Francisco, 1886, with Golden Gate Park's Alvord Lake Bridge, still around today if you aspire to see it. This concrete bridge, while unassuming at first glance, showcases a monumental engineering feat. The bridge's structural engineer, Ernest Ransom, invented a new type of concrete reinforcement that increased how far a straight concrete structure can span. Because like stone, concrete can't span very far before breaking apart. Take for instance the ancient temples of the Greeks. These buildings were built in a manner of structure called trabeation. And what is that? Take two vertical posts, then span across a horizontal lintel. There you go. You've got trabeated construction, most common is your typical wooden post and beam systems. But unlike wood, and instead like concrete, the stone lintels of Greek temples couldn't span very far before breaking. So those beautiful colonnades of Greek temples with all the columns in a row, that is a result of the fact that the lintel span between each column must be kept to a minimum, or else the stone cracks and the building collapses. The physics behind this concept I will keep simple, but know that at the heart of structural engineering is the following concept. So if you learn anything from this presentation, remember this. The weight of a lintel and everything above it puts force onto the two columns at either side. This downward push force caused by gravity is called compression. In fact, the whole lintel is undergoing compression about the top half of its body given the downward force of the roof. Now, Newton's third law of motion comes into play here. The columns on either side of the lintel redirect all the force back onto the lintel, and the forces on either side are cancelled out. The lintel stays in place. It's equilibrium. All is well in the world. But wait, what is happening right here? It appears that there isn't a balance. There is a giant void beneath the center of the lintel, exerting no resistance while above, gravity is at play. Forces are resolved at the ends, but the bottom of the lintel is being pulled back down to the ground as its sides are pinned, and the center is not. Imagine two friends swinging you back and forth from your arms and legs. You feel most of the weight of your body towards the center of your butt or navel, and that is exactly what is happening here. The pulling force is called tension, and it rides together with the force of compression. The relationship between both forces is respondent. Based on cause and effect, increasing weight atop a lintel increases the compressive load, which then naturally leads to greater tensile strain. Weight of a material and how densely spread that weight is always matters. Stone and concrete alike are heavy materials per volume, in addition to being poor in resisting tension. But these materials are no joke. 
they are among the strongest materials in resisting compressive forces. In comparison, we have a material like wood that is lightweight but weaker in resisting compression. Acceptable, considering wood is also strong and gets tension. It can bend quite far before breaking. Any kid with a stick can tell you that. Anyone playing with a stick can also tell you that longer sticks are easier to bend. A larger area goes unsupported, meaning that the sum of more force is transferred to a single point increasing pressure. Similar principle to torque. The longer the horizontal span between two vertical elements, the stronger the pulling force of tension. And stone can't resolve that much tension without breaking. Nor wood could withstand the heavy compressive weight of massive temple architecture. Thus, we get many, many stone columns in Greek temples. And so on and so forth. As throughout history, unless round arches or caves were involved, stone was gimped span-wise. Horizontal stone lintels and long spans out of the question, at least, until this cheeky bridge from San Francisco comes along with its flat crest and challenges the whole conception of what could be built. And that brings us back to structural engineer Ernest Ransom and why his reinforced concrete method is so important. Like wood, steel and iron are strong in tension. They can resist being bent. And when tension is so extreme that a metal beam does end up bending, Metals have more of an elastic property, as steel will return to its original shape when the force lets up. With this metallic quality in mind, engineers throughout the 19th century began embedding iron and concrete to mixed results, but it was Ernest Ransom who figured out the ideal method that he used for the Alvord Lake Bridge. That is, he invented an early type of rebar, twisted iron bars embedded inside concrete. The twist improved the bond to drying concrete. By the time the concrete is dried and solid, the rebar is a part of the whole body. This 19th century innovation improved the concrete and metal bond, and in the modern era, iron has been phased out for steel. The basic principle stands, as modern rebar retains a spiral. Reinforced concrete retains its impressive compression resistance while achieving a similar tension strength to steel beams. All that while at the same time using less steel compared to a typical beam and being better protected from fire and rust. With reinforced concrete, steel and concrete work together to resist applied force. Yeah, that's all well and good, but what's it to do with the truth about Stonehenge? Oh, don't worry. This is all on the way to uncovering your mystery. In fact, there's another important architectural wonder hidden here in the U.S. that I'd like to uncover for you. 30 miles north of San Francisco, hidden along the coastline of the Bay Area, the town Port Costa hosts an impressive find. In 19th century, Ernest Ransom designed Concrete Warehouse, one of the oldest reinforced concrete buildings still standing today, and the oldest reinforced concrete industrial building in America. And you may be thinking, so what? Well, this building is an artifact of evolution on a common building type, a pioneer in reinforcement. It was a turning point for industrial construction. The consequences here would be far reaching and ripple across the world, affecting the ways every person would come to both live and work. Rainer Banham's A Concrete Atlantis describes the impact of Ransom's work. And this poor Costa warehouse has roots in 19th century vernacular factories across both the U.S. and Europe. Power from steam engines or water mills affected the layouts of factories. Long axial-oriented bays were necessary as the kinetic energy generated by engines was transmitted to machines by belt drives running the length of a factory's bay. As the drive spins, belts transfer the movement to machines. Naturally, this meant buildings needed programs based on the use of belt drives. More efficiency could be attained by vertically stacking bays and using multiple belt drives connected to a single steam engine. But of course, there is diminishing energy returns by doing this due to friction loss. So instead, most factories were built in the shape of long and narrow rectangles following the shaft of a belt drive. But then, with such large and open factory floors, 
lighting can be a problem, and every hour too dark to work meant lost production time from management. These days, that's not a problem. Artificial lighting makes poor lighting conditions a solved problem. But in a time where electricity was uncommon, artificial lighting via gas lamps was the norm. Of course, the consequences of this was a substantial risk of fire, quite detrimental to those old factories given sparks flying from machines. So what could be done to maximize workable hours without relying on artificial light? The common solution was larger windows, big openings that bring daylighting into the space. Thus, the Daylight Factory was born. Factories optimized to harvest as much sunlight as possible, meant more hours in which workers remained efficient. But there was a problem with this. Structures made from brick masonry bearing walls, which was the norm at the time, like concrete or stone, can't have openings that span great distances without the use of many exterior piers and interior columns. Small spans meant small windows and less light. Not to forget, more interior columns that take up space that could otherwise be used for machinery. One solution was to use tall arches to achieve a greater span, as this ignores tension altogether. But more on arches in another video. The cheaper option for factory construction was making mass timber post and beam structures the weapon of choice to resist tension across long spans. Masonry bearing walls along the exterior with a wood frame interior. But recall all the machines with sparks flying, and the use of wood should foretell danger. Mass timber would catch fire, and given the thickness of the wood, burn at a slow enough rate to evac a factory. Owners would survey the damages, salvage what they could, rebuild, and repeat. Hence the many factories that burned down across the 19th century. So in Ransom's late 19th century Port Costa warehouse was built, he experimented with replacing what was typically a brick bearing wall on a facade with reinforced concrete wall. This was a conservative building, but the results were promising. At street level for the doorways, like with his Golden Gate Park Bridge, Ransom achieved a significant span with low crested arches. Though it would have been apparent at that point, the arch wasn't even necessary. Reinforced concrete could span a header above a doorway completely straight, and so replacing even more vernacular factory architecture with reinforced concrete was the next evolution. The three years of Ransom's career from 1903 to 1906 cemented him as the father of America's great 20th century factory architecture. With Pacific Coast Borax and the United Shoe Machinery Company, he invented and patented the modular frame system for reinforced concrete documented quite extensively in his 1912 book, Reinforced Concrete Buildings. The form of the long axial mills made in mass timber post and beam systems now scaled up to ludicrous dimensions in concrete. The United Shoe Machinery Company plant is three long massive blocks. Each is four stories of stacked frames and huge glass windows. Inside columns are set at a minimum so the space remains open for efficient use of square footage. And quick aside, the factory remains intact as a shopping center in Beverly, Massachusetts. A hundred years later, and the architecture seems to have successfully taken on a new program. With the Pacific Coast Borax plant, we can see a before and after picture that Ransom used to advertise his innovation. The previous 1897 factory in masonry with tiny windows in the new building in concrete with modern glass daylighting. The impressive spans of reinforced concrete met the program's requirements, while at the same time, concrete's fire resistance mostly eliminated fire concerns. While pure iron frames had similar benefits and were also used, the material was considerably more cost prohibitive than concrete and not as resistant to fire. Without much competition, Reinforced concrete soon made its way to become the dominant daylight factory structural material, surpassing wood as the weapon of choice against tension. A few decades of development later, and the most notable daylight factory was Ford's Highland Park plant, birthplace of the assembly line. This 1910 plant was a high-tech paradigm shift for American industry. The prime model, not only for vehicular production, was also factory architecture. 
Observe the walls, but don't let the presence of brick fool you. It's a non-structural veneer spandrel for the glass panes and reinforced frame. Here, daylighting was collected with as much rigor as cars assembled. Both the safety of workers and their time on the job was optimized, a major leap for America's industrial domination. All this ripples from Ransom's earlier excursions into reinforced concrete. As a model for structural design, this new implementation of reinforced concrete didn't end with the daylight factories. Soon, European modernists were introduced to American factories through magazines and site visits. And what was unleashed was a century-spanning obsession with open spaces and minimalism, which characterizes modern architecture. So now with retail, factories, offices, apartments, and even some modern homes, when architects work with structural engineers to design a building, both experts break down floor plans into structural grids. Each grid space is a structural unit enclosed by beams or walls, the intersection of grid points being the center points of columns. A structural engineer sees spans in each unit. An architect sees the arrangement of space. Both understand the grid is the framework that unites a building structure with occupiable space. And this unity, a carryover from factory architecture, is at the root of how most buildings have been and continue to be designed. Take the belt drive of the old daylight factories, suspended above the interior space along a structural bay. That isn't too different from an office's corridor also following a structural bay. There's a directionality, a movement, to how a grid is utilized in the layout of a floor plan. And this movement is also respected by the structure. Modern buildings take this a step further with grids that aren't merely rectilinear, but that are offset or skewed to any number of possibilities. Adaptation to the exact needs of an oddly shaped site or complex program. Radial and curved grids are even a possibility where curvature is applied to a typical Cartesian grid, implying round spaces and curved movement. And this sense of movement in space, with curved and rectilinear grids alike, is respected by the structural frame. Now, with a typical reinforced concrete frame, each lintel element and column is imbued with steel rebar. Starting at the bottom, the foundation supports columns. Columns support girders, and stacked above the girders are beams. These beams in turn support a concrete slab, which may be a floor or a flat roof. Each element has a hierarchy of depth, as tension is resisted with more reinforcement and more depth in the vertical axis. Girders, being the main element resisting tension, are the deepest in profile, followed by beams, then the slab. Together, the layout of these elements is called a one-way slab system and all of the components are cast together in concrete. There aren't any separate connections. It's all one body. Given what we know about tension, the concrete slab will undergo tension between the beams, so tensile reinforcement is added parallel to the direction of the girders, a single direction, hence the one-way namesake. The beams in turn resist tension across the long axis as the girders and columns pin the sides. One-way joist slabs are another reinforced concrete innovation where beams are replaced with many joists. Each joist is a much thinner concrete member compared to beams and are even tapered into small pans as a means of reducing overall weight. The tapering also helps in the construction process during the pour, but otherwise, the one-way joist system work similar to a one-way slab. The magic here, where it all comes together, is the marriage with architecture. See, the directionality of a one-way slab has a sense of movement to it. Its axial orientation implies that space should feel linear, ideal for corridors, the belt drives of old factories, or subliminally influencing a person to walk in the direction an architect desires. Structural forces are managed together with people, it's also worth noting that generally, one-way systems aren't as common today 
is the following systems. What happens if a beam and girder equally share the load of a floor slab, where a girder isn't larger in depth, the same dimension of a beam? This is a two-way system, a structural innovation where tension isn't resisted in one axis, but two equally. Imagine four people holding a blanket. Each person handles a corner. Internally, this is the direction of tension in the slab, as each end is supported. The previous one-way slab system's direction of tension would be closer to that of only two people tightly holding the sides of a blanket. The two-way system is a more even distribution of tension across a floor, but what is especially beautiful about this is that the sense of movement is also equally distributed. A two-way slab doesn't give any intuitive sense of direction at all. It's pure freedom for somebody to move under with no spatial cues, ideal for larger spaces like an open office. Plus, two-way systems have the unique characteristic of not requiring beams or girders at all. Waffle slabs integrate the resistance to tension within a network of cells, a sort of grid within a grid, in bed within the thin membranes of the waffle or rebar. So the layout and proportions of the waffle grid are directly representative of the internal reinforcement grid. That is, the rebar matches the waffle. Two-way flat plates are simply a flat slab and columns. A much greater density of rebar is inserted within to resolve the heavy loads and eliminate the need for beams. Recall, the tension is resisted with both depth of a member and rebar. Decreasing depth through the removal of beams is compensated for by even more rebar inserted into a slab. This is one of the more popular modern day options, especially for apartments, as it reduces the height of each story in a building to maximize units rented out. Plus, ceiling heights are no longer encumbered by beams. Finally, there is the two-way flat slab, effectively a flat plate, but with capitals above the columns to better support the column floor connections. This takes us back into ancient times, where Egyptians and Greeks had designed capitals for columns that are often thought of as purely decorative. But given that the connections of post to lintel or beam to column undergo heavy forces, a greater cross-section of resistance strengthens these points. Thus, the capitals on columns aren't merely for decoration, but also serve a specific structural purpose. So today, where concrete column and floor connections are especially overloaded in weight, there is often a concrete capital, which may be a small chamfered block or a pancaked out large flat rectangle, internally reinforced with a gnarly density of rebar. This is another example of vertical depth versus loads of rebar. Today, you'll often see two-way flat slabs with their chamfered or flat pancake capitals in parking garages, where ceiling height interference doesn't matter as much. Each of these types of support systems have different span ranges, with flat plates generally performing the worst given their lack of beams or girders. For more information on these spans, see the book Architects Studio Companion. It gives extensive diagrams and easy to read charts to quickly check dimensions for a space. Though the rule of thumb is almost always the greater the depth of a beam or slab, the greater the amount of reinforced material to resist tension. A deeper beam can subsequently span further. In layman's terms, when it comes to beams, size matters. Long spans have deep beams. Well, there you have it. Among perspective grids and drawing, or grid snaps and 3D modeling, consider structural grids your architectural bounds. There's a lot to play with here. A denser grid with minimal spans would require less reinforcement or shallow beams. A greater grid with long spans and you have to increase the amount of rebar inside a beam or increase its depth, often both. Though, what if structural grids didn't follow standard rectilinear conditions? What if we sought to pull back the confines of a grid 
reveal the potential that is inherent to such a mathematical system. The book Atlas of Novel Tectonics proposes 16 chapters of Breaking the Grid. These range from theoretical to quite practical solutions, though I'd first like to reference chapter 2, Difference in Kind slash Difference in Degree. Suppose you're playing chess. We all know to achieve victory, you must have an understanding that each piece is different and there is a hierarchy of meaning. Now, consider our beams, columns, girders, and slab floors from earlier. Each of these has different proportions and fulfill different goals. So we've got a hierarchy here too. Columns support girders, girders support beams, beams support slabs. Thus, each has a different size, shape, and reason to be in play. Okay, keep this image in your head and begin to imagine you're playing Go. In Go, each piece is the same and only achieves meaning in the game based on its relation to other pieces in play. In architecture, the same can also occur with frames. We can't look at Buckminster Fuller's geodesic domes or the Metropole Parasol in Sevilla as traditionally classified buildings. Where is the frame? Columns? Beams? Well, they're everywhere. The individual structural components are similar if not the same. And still, these pieces take on different meaning and behavior based on relation to neighbors. And this reminds us of... Effectively, the idea that I'm getting at here is that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. If each part was laid out individually, we are left with no inherent meaning, but isolate the column and the column's meaning remains. Most buildings, including the Daylight Factory, are like chessboards, buildings composed of a hierarchy of pieces. Again, think back to the girder beam column support reference. Frame systems have an inherent order that helps arrange a building. In contrast, the Go board, buildings that break traditional order, drive meaning from the arrangement of meaningless pieces. Depending on all the structural pieces acting together, the Gestalt form takes on a behavior. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Unlike a column, remove a strap from a geodesic dome and the piece has no meaning. It's just a piece. Put all these pieces together and we have a form. See how the top of the metropole parasol becomes a landscape in the sky. As the structural grids animate in response to the pedestrian path and ideal views, at this point, the traditional structural grid breaks down. Structure and program both become an intrinsic field as opposed to an extensively ordered set of rows and columns. The grid isn't abandoned, but changes behavior to adapt to any number of inputs the designer calls for. With Beijing's CCTV headquarters, the building's seemingly normal rectilinear grid is interrupted by cuts, notably at the suspended corners. Now, why do you think that may be? These aren't merely for decoration, but are explicitly placed around points of high structural stress. The overall grid members adapt and shift behavior to bolster structural weak points. The seemingly random pattern is reinforcing areas under intense stress due to the floating geometry. Chapter 16, Matter Force Relationships in Atlas of Novel Tectonics, proposes force as a relevant direction that can influence the geometry of structural frames. Let's use the Beijing CCTV building as a case study in load paths. All of the gravitational compression loads begin at the roof and must in some way or another connect to the foundation. Levitating buildings are of course impossible. So compression forces will move downwards through geometry, in this case the frame, all the way down into the foundation. The red arrows diagram this movement. The reason why both typical concrete one-way, two-way frames and also this adaptive CCTV building frame all work to resolve structural stress is that forces will be absorbed by all the masses connected, given that they are exerting force on each other through Newton's third law. That said, geometry isn't invincible and will fail, break apart, or buckle when the forces become too extreme. More on that in a later video. 
For now, remember that all forces will travel to the foundation, whether if it's through composed geometry resolving load paths or a building crumbling to the ground. But in any case, originally we were looking at reinforced concrete designs. So let's again jump back to the factories. After the Ransom designed Ford Highland Park plant, every automotive company was switching to the factory model, and Fiat's 1929 Lingato factory was yet again another type of reinforced concrete daylight factory. But, and this is really unique to the building's design, the factory was crowned with a rooftop racetrack for testing cars. A vehicle could start on the ground floor and with each successive level be assembled until reaching the roof for its first maiden voyage test drive. Keep in mind this was 1929, almost 100 years later, and conceptually, we haven't had automotive plants nearly as compelling. But to make this unique program work, the building employed a spiral driveway. The frames, which support the slabs here, are not like the traditional one or two-way systems we've looked at. No. Instead, the struts supporting these slabs have a unique and evolved form that, like the CCTV building, behave more like an adaptive system. Beyond the engaging aesthetic, this adaptive frame distributes forces through the geometrically complex path. Without serious calculations, it's hard to say how optimal this may be compared to a traditional concrete frame, but we can posit that given the increase in geometry at points of stress, the form is adapting to meet the specific load incurred by both the moving vehicles and weight of the concrete. A beautiful example of machine-like architecture, elevated to great fame in the 30s by Le Corbusier, but we have yet to hear of the master, whose work is unparalleled in both form and structure, spirit, as well as storytelling. Enter Antoni Gaudi. I'd attempt to make the case of him being the greatest architect to ever live, but that doesn't even need proving. His prime magnus, the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, still under construction to this day, is unlike any building in the world and rivals the pyramid's position as a wonder. The exterior facades tell the story of Christ, the nativity facade, a face of pure beauty. It's well-composed, highly ornamented, and naturalistic stonework effectively framing the story of Jesus' birth. Then there is the passion facade, simple, modern, angular. It's a dark face clad in sin, then dedicated to man. This facade's architecture dips into geometrical expressions that tell the story of the crucifixion. Evil is in the angles. Enter through either facade, and the interior is a step into a higher dimension, or at least, a projection of it down into the third. This is God's realm, and God doesn't deal in the confines of structural loads. The space simply is. This may all seem to be a strange geometry that's more akin to a DMT overdose, but the geometry is rational, and it expresses mathematics made aesthetic. Again, this is a higher dimensional space. It's God's realm. Beyond architecture, Gaudi was a master of structural engineering and also advanced mathematics. The ribbed forms of the church come from the shape of catenary curves, the natural profile that chains or ropes take at a suspended rest. The rest position of hanging chains is inherently indicative of a form in which loads have been reduced to the most minimal value. Gaudi, in fact, hung chains, weighted in ratio, to match the cathedral's load then inverted the chains via a mirror to find natural shapes for frames that would optimally resolve the heavy loads of the cathedrals. Chains dangling as catenaries embody tension, but to take the curve of the chain and invert it, now it's a shaping compression. Because the Sagrada Familia was carved from raw stone with no reinforcement, all the structural supports must be in compression given stone's weak aptitude to tension. Had this been a structure made with reinforced concrete, Gaudi would not need to go to the extra effort of using chain studies 
because the steel inside concrete would allow all sorts of wild shapes. The sky's the limit. But of course, part of the beauty of the Sagrada Familia is the specific nature of the architecture. The limiting factors of tension reduction is embodied in the form. In our modern era, reinforced concrete is used for the expansions, but the original work remains stone. Additionally, Gaudi invented another structural and formal component. The book Complexity and Contradiction by Robert Venturi describes how Gaudi invented a unique structural system through tilted pier buttresses to carry the load of the vault above and also buttress itself in one single form. Typically, most cathedrals have columns that carry the loads of the vault down to the foundation, then additional flying buttresses on the exterior of a nave to resolve the lateral thrust that pushes out from the nave's roof. Gaudi combined these two systems into one ideal form. We can return to thinking about load paths to see how gravitational forces follow geometry downwards, then are thrust outward, but at the same time caught and carried to the foundation via the same form. Now, if that wasn't enough, he used ruled surfaces to compose every shape in the cathedral's interior. And that? A ruled surface is basically just a fancy way of saying he only modeled in quads and all of his edge loops are perfect. A ruled surface, by definition, is a surface in which a straight line can lie between any points. If this sounds confusing, it's more intuitive when dealing with its conditions in 3D modeling. In polygon modeling, a ruled surface is a quad or quad row, in which you can conveniently insert an edge loop without issue. In NURBS, a ruled surface is lofted between two lines in which any number of mathematical operations and commands can be applied. In 1883, long before NURBS geometry or computer drafting, Gaudi, through the use of intense mathematical equations, developed interior shapes so that they'd be ruled. And the visual result to this is that much of the church's interior is assembled from geometric primitives that undergo mathematical transformations or blend into other surfaces. The columns transition from square to octagon to cylinder, a transformation and subdivision smoothing. Columns then branch out and explode into a ceiling that replaces coffers with planes in the process of transforming into stars. If you ever wondered what a space would look like made entirely out of the modifiers tab in Blender, well, this would be it. If God is to be found anywhere, it is within the laws of the universe and the subsequent romantic beauty that unfolds. So the Sagrada Familia is a house where form follows mathematics. Structure is perfectly fit, so the shapes embody the physical laws of tension and compression. While the building isn't cast in concrete, it is carved in stone. And speaking of stone, this takes us back millennia from the Sagrada Familia to stone. The complexity of mathematics to bear simplicity, and yet both places are portals to see in the world through the resolution of structural forces. Take a look now at Stonehenge. What do you see? The prototypical post and lintels, right? Rather basic and nude compared to the one and two way frame systems, further so for some of the fill based frames. The old forms of Stonehenge balance ancient forces about universal axes. The geometry here tells a story, and this one is about the unchanging laws of physics, from which the main players are tension and compression, forces inherent to Stonehenge and all structures thereafter. Wait, that's it? This is just all about holding up a rock with two other rocks? I mean, if you want to dumb it down that much, sure, I guess. What about the aliens? What about the portal to Mars? The human sacrifices? Well, I don't know about all that, but it is a portal to seeing physics. If you want to see aliens, you gotta master physics first. All right, that's it. No one's going to listen to this. Interview's over. What a waste of time. <laughs>